China is hungry. Hunger for growth. Hunger for power. Hungry for food. The average Chinese citizen today consumes double the calories of her peers 50 years ago. I know where you're thinking. So what? The changing appetite of one Chinese consumer might not seem like much, but multiply that by 1.4 billion, and our food landscape is about to be changed forever. Where's all this food coming from? I'm Weidu. I grew up in Chongqing, and now I live in Hong Kong. I've spent the last four years of my career as a foreign correspondent. In this series, I discover what it takes to put food on China's table. This area is being destroyed to establish a meal for the creation of gado. Some people may say that Alright, I travel across the world. Have you ever got hit in the head? Eating everything from the delicious. To the bizarre. We use the the eyes of the the I want to find out how feeding China is both an opportunity and a challenge. Something's cooking. I can smell it. And this being China, I can also hear it. Every time I return home, I feel something's changed. The roadside stalls with people jostling for food are now a rarity. Everything's slightly more organized. And it's got to do with the fact that my country is growing, growing richer. I'm just one Chinese, but I've got 1.4 billion countrymen. And for the first time, a third of us have now joined the swelling ranks of the global middle class. And as our middle class expands, our appetite expands with it. especially for meat. In the last 35 years, meat consumption in China grew sevenfold. In fact, we eat 28% of the world's meat, twice as much as the United States. I'm at the largest wholesale market in Beijing that has some 8,000 stalls. This is a little bit of a little bit of a little Nachagana When I was growing up, beef was a rare luxury. The only protein we could afford were eggs from the chicks were reared. 
Even chicken meat was a rare treat. My parents had it even worse. They lived through the 1960s Great Famine that starved over 15 million people. Food was definitely scarce, not to mention meat, but we've come a long way from that. Since 2011, Chinese beef imports have jumped more than 50 times, reaching 1 million tons in 2018. I'm here to find out how our love for beef is affecting the world. That's why I'm meeting Professor Chen Guangyan over beef stew. She's the authority on China's food consumption trends.这样的牛肉肯定是国产的吗还是这个也有可能是进口的应该是一块牛腩吧我觉得这个国产的也很多呀进口来了那么远东北国内的价格要低这是为什么呢你像国外它应该是农场组在养牛它那个地应该是世世
para a gente ter uma gordura bem tostada, né? bem feita. E daqui ela vai lá para a grelha. Hoje a gente está no Mato Grosso, que é o maior produtor de carne bovina do país. Né? E a gente tem uma carne diferente, que é uma carne criada a pasto. E no Brasil, sells lots of meat to China, where I come from. Why do you think? Acho que o principal motivo da, da carne brasileira estar tá em outros países, principalmente como a China, é que o chinês gosta de uma carne mais magra. E o Brasil tem isso. Além dessa carne mais magra, uma carne mais saborosa. Né? E com custo acessível também. But the problem is, we have 1.4 billion people. Com certeza, se os chineses se apaixonarem também pela carne brasileira, vai impactar para a gente, vai ficar mais cara a carne no Brasil. A gente vai ter que produzir muito mais né, para conseguir atendê-los. In 2018, Brazil exported 1.6 million tons of beef, the highest in history. Picanha. Mm, picanha. Yeah. That's the equivalent of 47,000 truckloads. And it's the thanks to China, which accounts for 44% of Brazil's beef exports. It is a beef bonanza, especially for the farmers. I want to meet the man behind my meat, and turns out I don't have to travel far for it. Five hundred twenty-five yeah. kilos per yeah. animal. Yes. Wow. And where are they going? They are going now to the slaughterhouse. Actually, very scared. A parte que vai para China que é o, o dianteiro, principalmente, subiu de 4 dólares e meio, subiu para 6 dólares. China could buy beef from Australia or the United States. Both are closer to China. Why do you think it's chosen to buy so much from Brazil? O Brasil é o único país que tem hoje condição e volume de abastecer a China. O Mato Grosso, só o Mato Grosso, ele é maior que a Austrália. A Austrália tem 26 milhões de cabeça de bovino, uhum. nós temos 30. Se tivesse plantas frigoríficas aprovadas, a gente conseguiria atender com 25% da nossa produção hoje para atender a demanda chinesa. Uau, wow, 25% da sua total produção. Yes. Nós acreditamos aí que vão estar trabalhando aqui 10 anos com um volume três, quatro vezes maior do que a gente trabalha hoje. A, car a carne brasileira vai ser um produto, daqui a dez anos, um produto muito, assim, normal dentro do costume chinês, acredito eu. Actually, that's already happening. Brazil's beef exports to China more than doubled from 358,000 tons in 2015 to 722,000 in 2018. The reason? Brazil has large swaths of virgin land north of Mato Grosso, which allows them to raise more cattle to feed China. All of this is yours. Nós. But I'm about to discover that filling China's growing appetite comes at a price. What is happening here? What's happening here? Essa área está sendo foi desmatada para para estabelecimento de uma pastagem para criação de gado. Brazil, home to the largest cattle herd in the world. Today, I'm going to meet an agronomist. You heard that right, an agronomist. It's my first time meeting one too. Isaia de Silva Pereira spends his days researching how to produce lush, disease-free crops. 
but recently he's had a change in job scope. Now he looks into the recovery of degraded forest in the Amazon. This area is being destroyed for the establishment of a pasture for the creation of gado. On my Google Maps, is still showing up as a forest. So this is quite recent. Possibilmente há uns seis meses atrás a um ano, mais ou menos, porque eles ainda não terminaram. A fase final do processo vai ser a queimada para limpar a área para implantar a pastagem. The rate of deforestation right now is it getting worse? Só nos, nos, nos primeiros meses desse ano, a O desmatamento aumentou 54% em relação ao ano passado. Why? Né? Expansão de área de agricultura, expansão de e pecuária, basicamente. The expansion of agriculture and cattle farms. E dentre mostly. eles, soja. Está no meio dessa história. And the soy is also soja e carne. Among soy and the meat are the main responsibles for the deforestation. But what changed this year? Brazil has always had a beef industry, always had very big agricultural industry. What changed? Porque o, todo o controle que tinha ambientalmente em governos anteriores tinha um, tinha um cuidado mais, estava tendo cuidado. Hoje, com a mudança, parece que a questão ambiental ela passou a ser secundária no país. E principalmente pela, pela, pelo desmanche dos órgãos, estão tentando desmanchar os órgãos que fazem o controle no âmbito federal. Since Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro took office, he's loosened the grip on protection of the forest and indigenous land. He made this year deforestation reach a 10-year peak. In Brazil, three-quarters of deforestation is driven by livestock farming. Since 2014, some 30,000 square kilometers of the Amazon, a landmass the size of Belgium, has been cleared primarily for cattle ranching. <laughs> Volmir Klamako is the owner of a big cattle farm here. He's been charged and fined repeatedly for a list of outstanding environmental crimes, but it does nothing to prevent him from holding political office. He's the mayor of his town, Itaituba. Olá. Boa tarde. Mayor, how are you? Seja bem-vindo aqui na nossa cidade. You welcome to the city. E aí, Sena? Garganta? Oh, yeah, we got into a little car accident yesterday on the dirt road. You do need better roads. Everything else about your city is beautiful. Today, he's proudly showing me his expanding cattle farm, grown on pastures and converted from deforested land. A China, ela tem um grande consumo. O país, quando tem um poder aquisitivo bom e tem muita gente para comer, é o melhor país. You said this land, the trees had been cut down when you bought it. Do you know why the trees were cut down in the first place? Porque nós para produzir, nós não conseguimos produzir lá dentro daquela mata. Temos uma mais de 200 milhões de habitantes. Temos que comer, produzir, vender, exportar, arrumar dinheiro que não tem. Vence a China quer dar dinheiro para mim deixar as matas aí. Mas eles não querem deixar de produzir. Nós também não queremos, nós queremos produzir. Raising cattle in China is expensive because China has less than a tenth of the world's grasslands. Even that is constantly encroached by expanding cities. In Brazil, this abundant land for pastures is what makes beef so cheap to produce and export. China is responsible for nearly half of Brazil's beef exports. But that's not all China is buying from Brazil. China also buys 75% of its soy imports from Brazil. And soy is a vital ingredient in animal feed that's critical in sustaining China's own massive livestock industry. This is all 
soy? Yes. This all is soy. crazy. How many tons? 6,000 tons. 6,000 tons? Yes. Wow. Tariffs on U.S. soybeans made Chinese buyers look elsewhere, and they turned to Brazil. Soy shipment from Brazil to China jumped a third last year. It's July now, so I've just missed the soy harvesting season. All the soy farmers in the area are now growing corn as the interim crop while they wait for soy planting to start in October. Okay, good to go. All right, we can go. Whoa! It's like going grass, but on a much bigger scale. Joelle Strabel is the second generation owner of this 9,000 hectare soy and corn farm. That's nearly 10% the size of Hong Kong. Even at this staggering scale, his farm's only considered medium sized. You want to drive? Um, can I try harvesting? Yes. Okay, let's do that. Oh, maybe, oh, oh, we're not stopping it? Oh, Jesus, okay. So this is the only thing I need to do, is to control direction. No, only this. Only this, okay, yes. steering. Because um, I'm a bad driver, I gotta be honest with you. The last time I drove was 10 years ago. I'm going to give it an ugly haircut. Okay, now here we come. The farm yields 5 million US dollars worth of soy a year, and pretty much all of it goes to China. Is that okay? It's easy. It's easy. Well, I'm sure it's not, but, but you know what it is? This is so strangely satisfying. Much fun. <laughs> Thank you so much, okay. sir. <laughs> if China hadn't been in this market in Brazil, what would farmers like you do with the soy you can produce? Ah, a gente sabe que a grande demanda é chinesa. Então, claro, indiretamente a gente está plantando para atender a China, né? Your farm is in the middle of Brazil. China is literally halfway around the world. How do the beans travel to China? Ah, é um caminho caro para a gente estar tá no meio do continente. Então a gente tem um custo alto de exportação dessa soja. E também porque a grande parte está baseada em frete rodoviário, que é um dos mais caros que tem. Eu tive nos Estados Unidos, lá você faz praticamente uma distância semelhante que nós para Paranaguá. É... Lá eles gastam 25 dólares e nós 80, né? According to a local soy lobby group, transport costs account for 30% of soy production costs in Brazil, three times more than that of U.S. soy, its biggest competitor. To get all these soy from the middle of the country to the northern port cities of Brazil, there's just one way. I'm in a state of Mato Grosso, the center of Brazil's agribusiness. This is all soy? Yes. This all is soy. crazy. 6,000 tons. But as exports increase, soy producers are facing increasing logistical challenges. I'm riding along the BR 163, a 1,770 kilometer highway cutting across the Amazon to bridge Mato Grosso to the port cities in northern Brazil. It's the same route as soy farmers take to export their beans. It's the only route and the bottleneck can be serious. It's 
these trucks are so long. You wonder how they don't tip over when they try to turn. I'm gonna go out and stretch my legs. I'm gonna go out, okay? It's a pretty grueling drive, two and a half days, and this is not even peak season. Come harvest time, the trucks can back up for miles. Most of the road is actually just this kind of dirt road. It's pretty dangerous because it, when it rains, it gets muddy, and uh, when it's dry, this loose gravel actually makes the road surface very slippery. To ease the bottleneck of the BR-163, Brazil has grand plans. One, an upgrade of the BR-163, making it wider and paved in asphalt. Two, a parallel railway to be financed by China. Three, turning the Tapajós River and its tributaries into a major industrial waterway fit for receiving large ships. To do that, they need to build over 40 dams along the rivers, again backed by Chinese finance and engineering. At the center of these three mega infrastructure projects is the strategically located Itaituba. Already, the small river town is seeing signs of change as new river ports and dam projects get underway. I'm in Itatuba, a small Brazilian town, about 100,000 people in the middle of the Amazon forest. This is where Highway BR-163 meets the Tapajos River. So as small as this place is, it really is the artery for the soybean trade between Brazil and China. This is the boat. We're taking this boat. Oh, that one. <laughs> Businessman Vomir Klamako, flush with money from agribusiness, has offered to bring me on a private boat tour around Itaituba. He happens to be the mayor here. These gigantic cylinders on shore, what are they for? This is soja, They get on a bigger boat to go to China. Connection. Se não fosse a China, não tinha esse grande produção de, 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 de soja. Tinha vontade de ser chinês. To expand the poor and deepen the river, you're going to have to borrow a lot of money from the Chinese. Are you worried in the slightest that they come in one day and say, your port is mine now, your river is mine now, because we paid for it? Esse patrimônio é mais da China que está se beneficiando de que isso do que nós brasileiros. Todos esses patrimônios que vocês estão vendo aqui é financiamento chinês. It's mind-blowing the scale of the ambition to open up the Tapajós Basin as a new food frontier. While Mayor Kalamako is excited, Brazil's indigenous tribes who still live in a forest and rely on the river are not. The Tapajós River runs through the Amazon forest and eventually feeds into the world's biggest river. 
There are plans to convert this into a waterway for barges to take soybeans from farms in Mato Grosso to the Amazon River ports. Soon we'll see chains of dams here, but not everyone is pleased. This indigenous reserve near Itaituba, a Monteruku tribe, is feeling the effects of the recent transformation. This is our river. We have this river here, our fishing. The name of the river is the Rio Tapajós. It's very important for us. The river here is our village chief, Brasilino Paiu. The village chief, Brasilino Paiu, has little time to meet me today. He's got to head to the city to find work and money because there's no longer enough wildlife to make hunting viable. É nosso Deus, né? Ele deixou para nós essa água. Era para nós, era para nós é, cuidar dela. Só que a gente não está podendo cuidar. A gente está cuidando, matando o rio, é o porque está acabando com a nossa terra e está trazendo mais a, a a doença, né? E vem na água, a água suja. I grew up next to a river just like this, the Yangtze. They built a very big dam, the biggest in the world. It flooded the homes of one million people. They all moved, but life became better for them because they moved into cities where there are better schools better job opportunities. Do you not want that for your people? No. I want to live this mode of life. We have a life more healthy. We take a walk in the mat to breathe air, the air pure. Pure, né? Chief, do you know where China is? No. I want to show you where China is, so where I come from. This is where we are, on the river. This is Itaituba, this is Brazil. And China is over here. That's China. The boats carrying soil beans on this river, they're going to China. What do you think of China? Eu, eu diria para eles que, que eles parassem de, de eu, eu convencesse eles para parar de plantar, de plantar soja na região da Amazônia aqui. É por causa do veneno que eles jogam em cima do, 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 da, da soja, né, que está pequenininha, então joga veneno, né, que é para o bicho não comer. But very likely the Chinese government will say, we're helping Brazil develop its economy. Para o governo, sim. Para o governo, sim. Tá? Pra... É nosso, o salário do, do empregado nunca aumenta. Aquele micharia, né? Aquele... É muito pouco. Like most Chinese people, I've just always believed that development is good. Everybody should want it. And those who don't just haven't got this figured out. But that conversation with the tribal chief, it does make me wonder that maybe development means different things to different people, and you just can't give your form of development to others. The wheels of change are in motion. Itaituba is already dredging its rivers for bigger ships to enter. River, isn't it? But the serenity might not last because the Brazilian government wants to build more than 40 dams on the Tapajos to raise the water level. Then the bigger boats can go all the way to Mato Grosso to load soil beans. It reminds me a lot of the Yanza River, and we built the Three Gorges Dam 20 years ago just so bigger boats can reach my hometown, Chongqing. 
In the end, the big boats never came because it just takes us so much time to cross just one dam. And to think they're going to have more than 40 is just mind boggling. The face of Brazil is changing and China is responsible for it in a big way. I'm with Bryn Milliken, an activist, tracking the impact caused by mega infrastructure projects on the Tapa Joe's Basin. And this is a very typical rainforest. This kind of vegetation here is like more for a flooded area. Okay. And these palm trees are called burichi, they like water. Somehow when you build a dam and flood the forest, this doesn't happen. It just, the vegetation just dies, it doesn't change into this. I have to be honest with you, this is the part that I find very difficult to wrap my head around because I grew up in Chongqing and as a result of the Three Gorges Dam, one million people had to move. Right. But they moved to richer areas where right. there are better economic opportunities, better schools, better okay. hospitals. So why and this would not sound good coming from me, a Chinese person, but why can they do the same here? I think investing in the Amazon is not like any other place. So I think where investments are happening, it's important for Chinese investors to understand what's the local context, environmentally, socially, culturally, and you can't just apply the reality of one region to another. Do you think Chinese investors do not understand these issues? China has capacity in terms of investment that is pretty much unequal. So I think the big question is, what sort of policies will China adopt to make sure that its investments are really living up to its standards in terms of social and environmental safeguards. What's happening is a public resource, a river, is being privatized. Dams are being operated in a way, constructed and operated in a way that the social and environmental impacts are being externalized. They're not mm -hmm. being incorporated by the dam company. I see, uh, I see what you're saying. So if you have a government now that is encouraging land invasions, land violence, deforestation, things are going to be detrimental to Brazilians, they're going to be detrimental to the Chinese, they're going to be detrimental to the whole planet. The beauty of this place is simply breathtaking. The Amazon forest is the world's largest rainforest and contains 10% of the world's known biodiversity. I bet when my Chinese friends look at a plate of beef, we don't think about the Amazon and the expense of our love for meat. I never knew the cost of my meat before I set foot in Brazil. But back home, I found one man leading the charge in promoting sustainable eating. He's the founder of the Good Food Fund and a vegan at that. Hi, Jenny. Um, I'm already here. I'm standing by the restaurant entrance. I wonder if it's a good idea to meet him here. Hi, Wei. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Is this going to be OK for you? I think so. I can find something I can eat. OK, yeah. great. OK, let's great. go. Can you do any soup base? It doesn't matter because there's no meat no, in it. No, I just take. Oh, I only take plant based. So. Plant based. Yeah. Oh, I, I guess okay. they have tomato. Tomato. That's tricky in China, isn't it? Yes. I'm gonna do one, the traditional yeah. hot yeah, pot. Right. It's got a uh, cow fat in it, so you you wouldn't want that. Uh, uh, yeah. This is the hot pot. Hot pot. I'll keep the cow fat out of your way. Right, <laughs> I'm sorry, does it offend you? Uh, I'm used to it. Okay, all right. <laughs> yeah. Try to imagine it is something else. What about, it's very unusual for a Chinese person to be a vegetarian. How did that come about? China has a long tradition of vegetarianism, right? Because yeah. we have the Buddhist tradition and well, that's Tao true. Taoist tradition okay. that, you know, encourage people to go veg. Right. So it's, it's not like, totally unusual, 
but it is unusual for people to go veggie for environmental reasons. Um, the reason I thought it was unusual was because I remember growing up, like eating meat. It, it's not a Chinese New Year's a special occasion, but it's still you do it a couple of times a week. And it sort of was an aspirational thing to be able to have meat every meal of the day. Isn't this, I don't know, like how do you picture this idea? Isn't it against that sort of aspiration? Yeah, it actually changed over the decades. Uh, I would say for health reasons, eat less red meat. Mm -hmm. uh, for environmental reasons, especially for climate change factors, eat less uh, beef. Beef? Beef is the worst in terms of uh, environmental footprints in, on our climate. If all the cows or the livestock in the world constitute a nation, that nation would become the third largest carbon emitter carbon emitter in the world in the world wow so it would be just the US. china and us and it's uh, the cow nation i've got more bad news for you okay i so ordered lots of beef keep them off my eyes <laughs> <laughs> i want to look at them <laughs> beef has just become a bigger thing in china what do you think that is well, I mean, lifestyle changing, right? Lifestyle is changing because people are eating all kinds of exotic stuff. Beef was not in our menu, especially in southern China. Because in southern China, oxen, oxen, they are yeah. like part of the family. You know, they help the family to plow. Surely now, it's no longer about the exotic factor, right? Because we've had it around for so long. Well, several, several other reasons. And when I interview people of my mother's generation who were born in 1950s, they all told me this one story about the 1984 uh, Los Angeles Olympics. 1984 Olympics was the first time uh, that many Chinese people ever watch a sports game live. Okay. So, because that happened to be the time when TV set uh, came into Chinese households. Okay. So that was the first first time they ever saw the Westerners on TV, and they were so su so surprised to see that foreigners or Westerners were so strong. They could jump so high, you know. They could run so fast. And they're much they taller. Strong, they're much taller. Yeah. So they came to the conclusion that um, they're stronger, they're taller, they're faster because number one, they eat a lot of meat, especially mm -hmm. beef. Mm -hmm. Number two, they drink a lot of milk, ah. cow milk. Hmm. So from 1984 Olympics, was there a government initiative of sort to promote beef and milk? Yes. I mean, the meat we are eating now is the cheapest in history. But if you add back all the cost that we pay to produce that meat, you know, it's the most expensive in history. Cheapest in history? That certainly can be true. The cheapest in history in, in terms of price. In, in terms of absolute price? Yeah. It's yeah, not that, that has to be true, because you look at history, you know. No average families ate meat like we are oh, eating okay. today. So it's the right? cheapest as the percentage of people's income, not the unit price. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cheapest relative, right? Relative I mean, for, to for, people's yeah, overall income. It's always relative to your mm. income, right? So. Okay. Uh, I probably have to go. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs> sure, my pleasure. Right, have a good yeah, enjoy <laughs> your meal. Uh, and my <laughs> <Eat> meat. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try. Bye. Okay, bye, Jane. He made me feel really bad about ordering all this beef, but I do like it, and I don't suppose they'll take it back, so. I'm not sure I can give up meat in a moment's notice, but next time I'm about to order heaps of meat, I'll remember what I witnessed in the Amazon, and perhaps there's a choice I can make to be less wasteful with meat.